All right, it's one, let's go. Uh, hello everyone, thank you for attending the seventh session of my Tour de France from A to Z. Uh, so you can find the previous uh, recordings of the sessions on the Princeton Public Library YouTube channel. This one as well will, will be recorded like all the other ones and it will be updated on YouTube in just a few days. Uh, as usual, you can ask me questions through the chat and I will answer them at the end of the session. And so let's go for today's program. All right, so today we're going to talk about La Réunion, Strasbourg, and Toulouse. And I'm very excited about today's program because I'm going to talk to you about one of my favorite places in France. So I hope that uh, I will share with you the, the, the wish to, to go there and maybe in, in a few years you'll, uh, you'll go to those places. Uh, all right. Okay, so first destination of the day is La Réunion. Uh, so the Réunion Island, as I just said, is an island, so it's not a city. So yes, I'm definitely uh, cheating today. So uh, La Réunion is an overseas territory uh, located in the Indian Ocean, uh, which is about uh, a bit more than 9,000 kilometers away. So that's roughly uh, 505,000. 1,700 miles away from mainland France. Uh, La Réunion is a volcanic island. Uh, so over there, you can find the Piton des Neiges, uh, which is 3 million years old uh, and has been inactive for the last 12,000 years, as well as the Piton de la Fournaise, which is uh, very uh, much younger as it's on only 500,000 years old. And uh, this one is actually the most active volcano in the world. Uh, so the biggest city on La Réunion is Saint-Denis, which is located uh, at the north of the island. Uh, over there, I don't know if you can see my arrow. Um, so in Saint-Denis, there are about 150,000 inhabitants, which represent about one-fifth of the entire population of the island. So like yeah, roughly, there's a bit more than 850,000 people who uh, live on La Réunion Island. Uh, so this island offers a very large variety of landscapes from tropical forests uh, in the east, savannas in the west. You can really have a feel like a lunar atmosphere close to the volcanoes and especially close to the Piton de la Fournaise, uh, as well as beaches and lagoons on the west coast. And so actually 40% of La Réunion's territory uh, is listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, so the island offers over 900 kilometers, so 560 miles of marked trails across uh, so the, the whole um, territory. So if you love hiking, trekking, and love like unspoiled nature, really La Réunion is made for you. Of course, it's far away, especially from the US, but really it's, uh, it, I've never been, but uh, it sounds like a very amazing place. Um, so France colonized the island in the second half of the 17th century, and slaves were broke, brought from Africa to cultivate coffee in the early 18th century. So contrarily uh, to Martinique and other overseas territory, uh, where uh, native people were almost decimated by uh, the French army, um, the Réunion Island was actually not inhabited by the time um, the French colonized the island. Um, and so because of some ways of immigration, especially from South Asia, so like uh, the Canton area in China and um, the south of India, um, so a lot of traditions and as well uh, vocabulary and language has been have been brought to La Réunion. And so the uh, Réunion Creole is actually um, so French based, but also has multiple influences. So uh, from Mag Malagasy, which is spoken in Mal Madagascar, as well as Portuguese, Hindi, Tamil and Gujarati, which are uh, languages spoken in India. Uh, and so, yeah, there are uh, the population of La Réunion is uh, multiracial. And so Réunion Creole is widely spoken by the population. And it's actually quite different from the Creole that's spoken in the French Antilles. 
So Martinique that uh, I told you about uh, a few sessions before um, and the other uh, islands nearby such as uh, Guadeloupe. So when you go to La Réunion, uh, you will actually have to land in Saint-Denis, the capital. So while you are there, you should uh, go to the Jardin de l'État, the garden, uh, state garden, uh, which is a four hectare, 10 acre botanical garden that was created in the second half of the 18th century. So more exactly between 1767 uh, and 1773. Um, so at that time, it was called the King's Garden, and it was created to introduce new vegetable species in the colony. Um, during the 19th century, so the collection of species uh, expanded. Um, and so yes, more, uh, especially uh, uh, fruit tree species were introduced in the 19th century from Asia, Africa, and Europe. So like the breadfruit, uh, lychee tree, mango tree, and cacao. Uh, this uh, state garden hosts the Museum of Natural History, uh, which opened as early as 1855. So this garden was remodeled in 1973 and as well more recently between 2004 and 2009 to actually uh, give it back its looks from the 18th century and as well to um, better protect rare and fragile trees. And it's been listed as a historical monument since uh, 1978. So after the first discovery of the, the capital, if you want to go, uh, go for a hike and start your journey through La Réunion, uh, you could go to the Mafat, Salazi, and Silao Cirque. So a cirque is a deep, steep walled basin on a mountain, usually forming the blunt end of a valley. So that's the, the definition given by uh, Merriam Webster. So those three cirques that you can see on the map at the top left of my screen, so they surround the Piton des Neiges, which is located really in the middle of the three uh, of the triangle formed by the cirque. So uh, to give you an idea, the Piton des Neiges is actually the highest summit of the island and it's uh, 10,000 feet high. Uh, in this area, you will find a lot of waterfalls as well. So the first one, Mafat, uh, Mafat Cirque, is uh, only accessible by foot through hiking trails or by helicopter. So this area is really wild uh, and you, really the nature is absolutely unspoiled over there. So um, uh, actually uh, in that area, um, at some point, some slaves except, uh, escaped from, um, from their masters and found refuge in that cirque. And since then, uh, they created some uh, villages and hamlets and still uh, 180 inhabitants uh, live across the village of La Nouvelle and a few other hamlets. The Salazi Cirque is um, more like a lush valley with a lot of waterfalls. <clears throat> um, so this one is about uh, six, 700, feet, 700 feet above sea level, and there are about 7,000 inhabitants who live in several villages and hamlets, including the one of Elbourg, which is on the list of the prettiest village of France uh, since 1998. I know that it may sound like a, a weird name, especially in French, but yeah, the village is actually called Elbourg. And it's, I guess it's far from being hellish. Um, so in this village, you will find a lot of typical Creole houses as well as gardens. And in Silaos, which is the highest uh, of the Cirque, so located at about 1200 meters high, 4,000 feet high. Um, so this one is actually the door um, that gives on the Piton des Neiges. So if you want to hike up to the Piton des Neiges, you would actually start your hike in Silaos. So in this uh, cirque, you will find a lot of canyons as well as deep ravines, uh, which are ideal for canyoning, trekking, hiking. If you like climbing as well, that's uh, definitely a good spot. And the Silaos village hosts the Maison de la Broderie Museum, so House of Embroidery. And this museum showcases uh, embroidery works of uh, technique and patterns that have been created in Silaos village that are called Jour de Silaos. Uh, so this technique has been invented in the 20th century in that village. Uh, 
So on the left, you can have a view of uh, the Sealhouse town, though, so that's surrounded um, by uh, ramparts, like mountain ramparts. And on the right, so you can have a view of the Bridal Vale Falls. So this waterfall would take its name from uh, the legend of a man who was opposed to his daughter, uh, who was who wanted to marry a wealthy man. And so this man was chasing them on the hills of the Sarazi Cirque after they got married anyway. And supposedly the young bride slipped and fell off the mountain and her veil is thought to have got caught on the cliff's face. So the father uh, allegedly passed a night at the top of the cliff after his daughter disappeared and his tears were falling in the raging waters of the waterfall. After the, th the three cirques, you can go try your luck in the Piton de la Fournaise, so, which is actually the number one attraction of the island uh, and attracts more than 400,000 people each year to, uh, to hike on the volcano. So you will actually find some hiking trails that start directly uh, at the sea level, like close to the beach, all the way to the top of the volcano. So that's quite a steep hike because it's like 2,000 meters of elevation, so a bit, a bit more than 6,500 feet. So like, yeah, you have to you have to be fit to climb directly from the sea to the top. There are some other hiking trails that start a bit uh, up more up on the mountains. Um, you can find as well some biking trails and horse riding trails at the bottom of the mountain. If you like speleology, uh, you can uh, try that in lava tunnels. Uh, so you would basically explore the bowels of the island uh, and go under the land through lava tunnels that have been created uh, by some eruptions. So some have, have been created like a thousand years ago, but some are very more recent. For example, there's one uh, that has been created by the eruption in 2004. And so, as I mentioned earlier, so the Piton de la Fournaise is, is one of the most active volcanoes on the planet. And I have some friends who actually visited the island, I think it was in 2017. And so they stayed um, on the island for, I think, three weeks. And on this three week span, there had, there had been two eruptions. So like, yeah, it's very, very active. And so the last one, um, the last time the Piton de la Fournaise erupted was actually last year, it's September, 2022. Uh, whoop, sorry. And so this picture actually is uh, of an eruption that happened in 2007. So I've, Never seen a volcano eruption in my life. That's on my bucket list, but still, like you don't want to be too close. Like definitely not. And after a long hike, you should definitely, like you know, have a good rest. Uh, and you can do that on the very long beach uh, on the west coast of the island. So if you see my arrow, so it's actually like yeah, all along the, um, uh, the southwest coast uh, on La Réunion, that's where you will find uh, a 30 kilometer uh, long beach where uh, actually snorkeling, diving, kayaking and sailing as well as like cat surfing are very popular activities. And which is nice is that the water temperature uh, is always between 24 degrees and 30 Celsius degrees all year round. So that's that sounds really nice. That sounds like something I would like to try. Um, so as you can see, uh, there's a lagoon along the uh, along the beach. Um, and so on this lagoon, you can actually find a 22 kilometer long coral reef. So the Reunion Island Nation Natural Marine Reserve uh, definitely works at protecting this uh, coral reef, as well as the uh, many uh, fish species uh, that live in that habitat, like triggerfish, stingrays, sea turtles, and other colorful tropical uh, fish that live in the area. And you can definitely uh, take a boat tour to as well observe humpback whales and dolphins. So uh, the coral reef is actually uh, not 
um, does not cover like the whole uh, coast uh, where you can find the beaches. It's more like in the northwest, uh, like yeah, more on the northwest coast of the island. And so it's very important if you want to go swimming on La Réunion Island to respect the um, uh, swimming perimeter um, as there are sharks who live in the area and there had been some accidents in the past happening to people who actually went swimming in an area that was not under surveillance or that was known to actually uh, be the place where uh, sharks had been spotted. So like, it's very, very important to uh, respect the swimming perimeter in La Réunion more than anywhere else in France. So the, the Réunion, La Réunion is quite a vibrant island and offers a few festivals uh, all year round. Um, and so actually, uh, because of the waves of immigration to La Réunion, uh, so some, uh, so people actually, when they uh, left their country uh, to go to La Réunion, they imported their uh, traditions from their home countries. Um, so like, yeah, actually, uh, so Chinese New Year, Tamil New Year, and Deepavali, for example, which are tradition from South Asia would be celebrated on La Réunion Island. So apart from uh, apart from those, so uh, the Sakifo Music Festival uh, usually begins uh, usually is set at the beginning of June in uh, Saint Pierre, uh, town on the south of the island. So it's a rock, pop, electronic music, and Maloya festival that attracts about thirty thousand spectators each year. The Fed Calf, uh, also called the um, Reunion Celebration uh, of Freedom, uh, happens every year on December 20th and celebrates the abolition of slavery and more precisely, uh, the day it was proclaimed on La Réunion Island on December 20th, 1848. So uh, all across the island, uh, some villages and towns and cities would uh, organize celebrations with like free concerts, of Segen Maloya, which has music genres um, and dances from La Réunion, as well as dance performances, parades in costume with colorful floats, uh, poetry workshops, exhibitions, and so on. So the word CAF actually come, uh, comes from the word, word CAFRE, C-A-F-R-E-S, uh, which, which is still a name given to Black people who descend uh, from slaves. Um, then Le Grand Red is a sports event that usually happens in October. Uh, so if you're like someone who loves sports, you may try to go there um, as it offers one of the most difficult races in the world. So which is called the Crazy Diagonal. So basically it goes from Saint-Pierre, so in the southwest um, of the island to uh, Saint-Denis, which is at the, at the top north. So that represents uh, 165 kilometers, so about 100 miles, with very intense going ups and downs. So that's uh, a challenge that I'm definitely not ready to take right now. <laughs> Um, and so, yes, uh, apart from this one, there are three other uh, races called the Bourbon Trail, the Mascarene Trail, and the Zembrocol Trails that, by comparison, seem uh, way easier. And uh, Guandi is a Chinese tradition. Um, so, uh, chi um, Chinese descendants still celebrate uh, that uh, warrior who became a god uh, for about three days each year um, by actually um, uh, perpetrating uh, cultural and religious rites uh, to celebrate that God with uh, as well dances with lion and dragon costumes, firecrackers, um, with um, concerts of Chinese music and games, uh, as well as talks. Uh, there would be Chinese uh, food stands across the island, as well as Chinese medicine stands. So when it comes to food, a reunion cuisine mixes different influences. So of course, uh, French, but also Malagasy, East African, Indian, and Chinese cuisines. So you can start a meal at La Réunion, on La Réunion with taking uh, bonbon piment, 
uh, which is uh, an appetizer or a snack. Uh, so bon piment are savory and spicy fritters made of lentils or lima beans and seasoned with hot pepper, turmeric, chives, cilantro, cumin, and ginger. They kind of look like falafels, but they definitely taste different. So they were actually imported to La Réunion in the 19th century by Muslim people from India and Pakistan. Uh, the most emblematic dish that you can try in La Réunion is the rougail saucisse. So this traditional dish is made of chicken or pork sausages, either fresh, fresh or smoked. And so those uh, sausages are good with tomatoes, onions, and hot peppers. And it's usually served with rice and beans or lentils. The civet de zurit. <clears throat> so, uh, so zurit means squid. So it's basically a squid stew uh, that's cooked in red wine with onions, garlic, ginger, kaffir lime, and other herbs. And you can finish your meal with a uh, cold pistache, which is a Creole sweet. So there's actually no pistachio in that dessert, uh, but grilled peanuts that are called pistache. So those grilled peanuts are mixed in hot caramel, then put on a baking sheet to cool and harden. And when it comes to liquor uh, on La Réunion, so rum and especially infused rum is very popular on the island. And there are actually as many recipes as inhabitants. So the principle is that you macerate fruits like pineapple, passion fruit, pretty much anything you can imagine, um, and spices like cinnamon, vanilla, um, especially vanilla because it grows on the island, uh, in sugarcane-based rum or molasses-based rum so that the rum gets the ingredients flavor. So one that's very popular on La Réunion is actually made with uh, faham orchids. So this tradition of infused rum started in La Réunion and then extended to the Anti. But as far as I remember, I, I, I feel that's my personal feeling that uh, infused rum was not that, that popular in Martinique, but definitely more in Guadeloupe. But like in Martinique, it was easier to like find some like Ponche or the cocktails that I talked to you about uh, a few sessions before. But like, yeah, you know, on Guadeloupe though, like infused rum is very popular as well. All right, so now we're going to a completely different place uh, called Strasbourg and it's one of my favorite places in France. So Strasbourg uh, is the capital of the Alsace historic region. So at the very uh, top, uh, northeast of France, so in that area. Um, so it's directly on the border with Germany. So when you are in Strasbourg, you can just take a tram and up, you can actually uh, get off the, the tram and you are in Germany. So the entire city center of Strasbourg is on the UNESCO World Heritage List. Um, and uh, Strasbourg is also one of the three European Union capitals alongside Brussels and Luxembourg. Uh, so Strasbourg hosts the European Parliament and headquarters uh, and the headquarters of the Councils of Europe and many other institutions and um, places related to the European Union history. Uh, so Strasbourg is the French city with the most developed cycling network. So if you like cycling, there are more than 560 kilometers. So that's 350 miles of cycling trails in the city. So cycling is very, very popular in Strasbourg. Um, so that city actually changed nationality four times in 75 years between 1870 and uh, 1945. So basically, uh, the Prussian uh, took over Alsace uh, uh, at the end of the 1870 war. Um, then it, uh, France, uh, it got back to France at the end of the First World War when uh, Germany invaded France. During the Second World War, they controlled Alsace again, and France uh, finally got it back at the end of the Second World War. And uh, so still to these days, 25% of the population of Alsace are able to speak both Alsatian and French. So Alsatian is a dialect that um, derives from Germany and from German, sorry. Uh, and it's more common 
to hear Alsatian uh, spoken in small villages rather than in big cities like Strasbourg. Uh, so I'm insisting of like a uh, number of like the proportion of people who speak both Alsatian and French because the number of people who actually express themselves only in Alsatian tends to decline uh, year after year. But like yeah, still uh, some people are uh, actually able to speak both. So when you are in Strasbourg, the main uh, one of the main jewels of the city is the Notre Dame Cathedral, which has been described by Victor Hugo as a gigantic and delicate marvel. Uh, in uh, the Rhine, uh, in one of the letters that was published in the Rhine. So this cathedral, this Gothic cathedral was built between 1176 and 1439. Uh, its spire is 142 meter high, so roughly a bit more than 450 feet. Uh, and it can be seen across the plains of Alsace. And the funny thing is that, so it's not really visible on the picture, but maybe you can have a glimpse of it is that contrarily to uh, a lot of cathedrals around the world, this one has only one tower, uh, which gives it a very asymmetric look, which is kind of unique. But so yeah, this one has only one tower instead of two. So uh, the Strasbourg Notre Dame Cathedral was actually made with pink sandstone from the Vosges. Uh, so the Vosges are a mountain range uh, that are very close to Strasbourg. Um, and so inside the cathedral, you can find some stained glass windows that date between the 20, uh, 12th and the 14th centuries, as well as an astronomical clock that was built in the Renaissance that you can see here. Uh, so it was built between 1547 and 1574 by uh, Swiss clockmakers, sculptors, painters, and automaton designers that who all work together in order to create uh, this amazing work. So the current mechanism inside uh, the clock has been built in the 19th century, exactly between 1837 and 1842. And so every day at half past, half past noon, there are some animated figures that come out every day to kind of parade. So on the uh, lower level, uh, you have uh, the different ages of life personified by uh, a child, uh, a teenager, an adult, and an old man, an old man who parade uh, in front of death, represented here as a skeleton. And on the upper levels, uh, the apostles are uh, saluting Christ uh, every time they, they pass by. And so uh, the Cathedral of Strasbourg attracts around 4 million visitors each year, uh, which makes it the second most visited cathedral in France after Notre Dame de Paris. And as Notre Dame de Paris has still not reopened yet, I guess that we can say that for the moment, it's the uh, first most visited cathedral at the moment, at least in France. So, uh, then you can go to the Petite France Quarter, which is uh, an area that I absolutely love. And every time I go there, I'm just like in awe because I found that absolutely beautiful. I'm absolutely in love with half timbered house. So for me, Alsace is an actual paradise because that's what you can see everywhere, <laughs> which I absolutely love. So the Petite France Quarter, is the most picturesque neighborhood of the city. Uh, over there, you will find a lot of uh, narrow medieval streets with half timbered houses, which is definitely an influence of German architecture. Uh, some of them uh, have uh, very flowered facades. And so some of those half timbered houses have actually built, uh, have been built between the uh, 17th and 18th century. Uh, during the Middle Ages, it was actually the neighborhood of tanners, millers, and fishermen. And still to this day, so the big house that you can see at the front is called the Tanner's House. This one was actually built in 1572 and is the crown jewel of the neighborhood. Uh, so uh, I don't know if it maybe it makes you uh, think of like uh, a movie or something. 
uh, for me, when, I, when I'm in Strasbourg, I have the impression that I'm in uh, the Beauty and the Beast, the 1991 uh, Disney movie version. Uh, so like, yeah, that really gives me the impression if you're more into like Japanese movies, um, it makes me think of the Holes Moving Castle uh, by Miyazaki. And so those two movies were definitely, uh, like yeah, those drawings of the cities were definitely influenced by Alsatian and uh, German architecture. So as you can see, uh, this neighborhood is crossed by, by some canals. And so the Il River that actually crosses uh, the city is kind of divided into, you can imagine a hand and it's five fingers. So the five fingers of the, the Il River are actually like, uh, crossing the the city center into five different canals, and for that reason, uh, Strasbourg and the, especially this neighborhood is often compared to Venice. And it's absolutely possible for you to take a cruise on the Il River and to visit the city center that way. So more picture of the city center that I absolutely love, like especially this house on the right, like yeah, with all the half timber that I absolutely love. And I really love Alsace as well, because like apart from the half timbered houses, you can see that they are very colorful as well. Uh, and you will see even you will see it even more um, in just a few minutes when I will tell you about some other villages in Alsace. But like yeah, that's like those two features, like the the colors and the and the timber that put together it's just something that a view that I will never be like yeah i will always like to be in, in that area uh, if you want to know more about the european districts you uh about sorry about the Euro european union uh, you should definitely aim to the european districts where you will find a lot of uh, buildings related to the european union its institutions and history um so you will see there the Euro European Parliament. There is as well the Palace of Europe, which hosts the Council of Europe, the European Court of Human Rights, the Lieu d'Europe, which is a museum uh, about the history of Europe, uh, as well as Arte headquarters, uh, which is a French German uh, TV channel. So the European Parliament building was actually inaugurated in 1999, and it's definitely possible for you to visit um, the uh, so this building and especially the European Parliamentary Chamber, as well as the Parliamentarium Simon Veil, which is um, an immersive space that lays out the process behind making law for the whole of Europe, and explains what the members of the European Parliament are working on. So you can just like click on a representative face and see like what his project is at the moment, and what he's working for. Uh, the Parliament also offers several exhibitions about uh, the European Union, and uh, if you want, and if there's one uh, when you're uh, visiting it, you can attend a plenary session. And so here you go for three villages that I went to and that I really loved. Uh, so Kaisersberg, Ribovile, and Regivir. So there, there are even more very, very pretty villages in Aldaz, but I'm just going to talk to you about these three ones because those, those are places that I, went to, that I went to. So if you look at the map at the top right of the screen, so those uh, villages are actually located a tiny bit southern of Strasbourg. So um, Alsace is actually uh, divided into two departments. And so those three, um, uh, villages are actually located in, in the south part of Alsace. Actually close to Colmar, which you may have heard about because it's actually Princeton's uh, sister city. So one more reason to go to Alsace to discover Princeton's sister city. So Kaisersberg, Ibovile, and Rigvir are, so those three are medieval towns located along the Alsace Wine Road. Once again, I will talk to you about that a bit later. Um, and so yes, those three are located between plains, vineyards, and mountains. So Geisersberg is a flower. You, over there, you will see a lot of flowery, half-timbered houses again, as well as ruins of the 13th century Schlossberg Castle. 
And this uh, village was actually elected the favorite village of the French in 2017. Uh, in Riboville, so still more half timbered houses. Uh, some of them actually date from the 15th to the 18th century. And overlooking this village, you can see uh, the ruins of three castles of the Lord of Ribopierre. Uh, so the castle um, of uh, Oribeaupierre, the saint Henri castle, as well as the Gearsburg castle uh, that were uh, built between the 11th and the 13th century. And you can actually take a hike from Ribeauville uh, to, the, to those castles. And as for Rigvir, uh, so it's been labeled one of the most beautiful villages of France. And uh, because it's uh, located in the very heart of the Alsace, Alsatian vineyards, it's been nicknamed the gem of the Alsace vineyards. So the funny thing about uh, Rigvir is that it looks today more or less as it did in the 16th century. Um, and so over there you will see uh, all the possible declinations of sculpted half timbering, oil windows and inner courtyards uh, with old wells and fountains. And you can see, uh, you can find over there the Daldo Tower, which was a former defensive gateway that dates from the 13th century. So on the left, you can uh, have a glimpse of Rigvir, uh, sorry, of Riboville, uh, with, as I was uh, mentioning before, one of the three castles that overlook the city from above. And on the right uh, is an example of the uh, houses that you can find in Rivier. Once again, I'm, I'm definitely in love with those three villages. It's absolutely wonderful and gorgeous. So uh, here uh, you, I give you only a sample uh, of the cultural life of Strasbourg, which is very vibrant as well. Uh, so Fars is the Strasbourg Street Art Festival, which is free, a free festival that usually happens uh, during one weekend mid-August in the city center with like circus, theater and acrobats uh, performances all around the city center. Musica is a contemporary classical music and experimental music festival. Uh, so this festival uh, sh sheds a light on the 20th century composers and contemporary composers as well. This one usually happens the second half of September. Uh, so the Strasbourg European Fantastic Film Festival, as you can guess, is a movie festival uh, that started in 2008. And so this one, as you can guess, focuses on fantasy, science fiction, but also horror movies. Um, so uh, over, if you go there, so you will see uh, screenings um, of uh, feature and short film, uh, oh, sorry, uh, feature and short films. And the festival also uh, opened recently on video games as well as virtual reality movies. And so Strasbourg is very famous as well for its Christmas market. So basically there has been a Christmas market in Strasbourg since the 16th century, sorry, which makes it the oldest uh, Christmas market in France. It lasts four weeks uh, until December 24th. And every year there's a 30 meter high, uh, so almost 100 feet high, uh, huge Christmas tree that's put in the main square in Strasbourg. Uh, that's highly decorated, as you can see, like illuminated by a lot of different colorful lights. Um, and so across the whole city center, so you will have about 300 stands that sell uh, arts and crafts, uh, Christmas decorations, but also food, uh, like typical cookies that you can find during Christmas time, like manolo, bredolo, as well as mul wine. Um, and so yeah, the Christ Kindles Merrick basically mean, uh, means market of child Jesus. So uh, during, during the month of December as well, you will have a lot of um, concerts in churches. And so yeah, a lot of uh, villages and towns uh, around Alsace have uh, their own Christmas market, but really the one in Strasbourg is the biggest one that you can find in Alsace and even in France. 
So when it comes to food, um, so Alsatian cuisine uh, is very close to German cuisine uh, in the sense that they use both use pork a lot. So first you can try the Flammküche, so which means uh, tarte flambée. So it's basically made of bread dough that's rolled out very thinly in the shape of a rectangle or an oval. Uh, and is covered with crème fraîche, thinly, thinly sliced onions, and lardon. The most emblematic dish that you can find in Alsace is the choucroute garni. So it's made with uh, Alsatian sauerkraut. So um, to make the, the sauerkraut, so you use a very specific kind of uh, cabbage that uh, has been naturally fermented and that grows uh, only in Alsace. So you mix that sauerkraut with pork, pork meat, most of the time sausages and charcuterie, and often potatoes. The kugloff, uh, which has a lot of uh, ways to write, uh, it's a kind of brioche that can be sweet uh, if you add raisins uh, soaked in rum or kirsch, or it can be savory as well if you make it with lardon or nuts. So it has a very specific shape, and it's due to uh, the mold to make it, which is quite high, uh, quite high and hollow in the middle. So um, this kind of cake has, can also be found in uh, Czech Republic. And finally, the pain d'épices. So uh, it's called gingerbread in the US. So it's quick bread made, made of rye flour, honey, and spices. So cinnamon, clove, ginger, and star anise. Uh, so it's uh, pain d'épices is mostly made around Christmas time, uh, and this since the 15th century. So this one is really like celebrating Alsace and, and its culture. So I was talking, mentioning earlier the Alsace wine route. Um, <clears throat> so uh, it's a tourist trail that has been launched in 1953, which is about 100 miles long. Uh, so it goes all the way from Marlenheim in the south to Tan in the south. So it passes through 119 wine growing villages and about 720 wine producers uh, make wine in the area. So my in-laws actually live uh, in Molsheim and there are some um, vineyards right behind the house. So it's really nice when you want to take a walk. It offers a very nice view over the plains of Alsace. And so uh, there has been, uh, there have been vineyards in Alsace since the Middle Ages, uh, which uh, actually make you want to ask you a question. So you can find the world's oldest cask of wine at the Hospice de Strasbourg historic cellar. When do you think this wine was made? 1472, 1550, or 1602? You can unmute yourself or write your answer in the chat. But yeah, when, when do you think the oldest uh, wine still in human possession was made? So I have an answer C over here. Does anyone else want to give it a try? C, B. Well, you'd be surprised, but it's actually answer A. The oldest cask of wine dates from 1472. And believe it or not, but it's still drinkable. So your reaction might be ooh, or it can be wow, or maybe a bit a mix of both. But so yeah, the it's actually from 1472. And apparently uh, it's been open at very rare uh, occasion in the last dozen years. So unless you've done something or that has been actually fantastic, it like yeah, you, I mean, yeah, it's not open very, <laughs> very often. Uh, so in Alsace, there are seven main uh, grape varieties that you can find. Um, so which are mostly white. So Riesling, Gewurztraminer, Pinot Blanc, Pinot Gris, Pinot Noir, which is the only red wine var variety, as well as Muscat and Sylvaner. 
uh, some uh, sparkling wine, crema wine are actually uh, also produced in uh, in Alsace. And so along the along the Alsace wine routes, there are also 51 Grand Cru that are produced, including two made in Rigvir and two in Ribovile. So if you go through those villages, that's one more reason to actually go there. Uh, and if you like biking, you can actually take the bike route, uh, which runs for a bit more than 80 miles along some vineyards. And uh, most of the vineyards are open to visit and wine tasting. So if you like, especially if you like white wine, uh, that's something you should absolutely try. So next up, this time in the south of France is Toulouse, uh, which happens to be my uh, next destination in real life. So working on this presentation actually enabled me to project myself in the that new chapter of my life. <laughs> All right, so Toulouse is France's fourth largest city. 500,000 people live in the limits of Toulouse municipality, but if you uh, take the um, direct uh, urban area surrounding uh, Toulouse, that's more than 1.5 million uh, people who live in that area. <clears throat> so it's nicknamed the Pink City, uh, because most of the buildings, uh, especially in the city center, uh, were made of uh, pinkish terracotta bricks. Uh, so Toulouse is crossed by the Garonne River and three canals, the Brienne Canal, the uh, Garonne Side Canal, as well as the Canal du Midi. Uh, and also Toulouse is uh, famous to be the center of the European aerospace industry. So that's where you will find the headquarters of Airbus. Uh, the city hosts the Toulouse Space Center, which is the largest in Europe. Uh, you will find as well a space museum, as well as a reputed piloting, piloting school. And if you've ever heard of the Concorde, which was a supersonic plane, so this one was actually conceived in Toulouse. Rugby is a very popular uh, sport in the area, and the Toulouse May rugby team won the highest number of championships in France. So it won uh, the French championship 22 times and the Europe championship uh, five times. So I will be cheering the Toulouse team when I when I will be living over there. Um, and if the weather is good and clear, you can actually have a glimpse of the Pyrenees, which are located a bit more than 120 kilometers, so 70 miles away in the south of Toulouse. So I was mentioning just earlier that Toulouse uh, is um, like a big space when it comes for uh, when it comes to aerospace industry. So you can go to the Cité de l'Espace if you're interested about knowing more about space. So it's a scientific discovery center focused on space flights that opened in 1997. So if you go to uh, the Cité de l'Espace, you will see full scale models of the Ion 5 rockets, as well as the Mir and Soyuz modules. And you probably recognize this um, module of the Apollo mission right there. So it's not the actual one, of course, but it's only a full scale model of the module that was used for the Apollo mission. So uh, in this uh, museum as well, you will have some interactive exhibits about space exploration, astronauts' daily lives and tasks, as well as the universe, the solar system, and the Earth. And if you go to the planet, to the two planetariums, you will uh, be able to attend some immersive shows that give you the impression that you're exploring space and floating into space. Uh, so this museum also organizes some workshops and activities, including one about uh, how the European Space Agency recruits new astronauts. So if you want, you can actually go through the stages of the selection process to see uh, what it looks like to apply for being an astronaut. So next, the capital. So uh, it hosts the city hall and the opera house. And since its, since its construction in the late 12th century, it's been the seat of the municipal power of Toulouse. 
So this building uh, was actually commissioned by the capitals who were the governing magist magistrates of Toulouse uh, at the time. So the current uh, neoclassical facade that you can see over here actually dates uh, from the 18th century. And it's been made uh, with the typical regional pink brick that I mentioned earlier. Um, <clears throat> only the courtyard and the gate survived from the original medieval buildings, but that's pretty much it. Like all the rest is, um, is way newer than that more recent. Um, so inside the Capitol, you can go through the re reception rooms that were decorated by local artists in the late 19th century, um, such as the Paul Jarvet room, uh, which uh, was the former um, wedding, room cer wedding ceremony room, which is decorated with uh, allegories of love by um, artist Paul Jarvet, who was from Toulouse. And in the Henri Martin room, uh, you can find uh, 10 giant canvases painted by Henri Mar Martin uh, that depict life in Toulouse across the seasons at the end of the 19th century. And if you go through the Salle des Illustres, the whole of the illustrious that you can see over here, so you, you will be able to see, uh, so once again, paintings and works for from um, Toulouse, uh, artists from Toulouse uh, that retrace the history of the city. And uh, you will see some busts as well uh, who bring back to life the personality that have defined uh, the city of Toulouse. So the entrance for the capital is free. And so admitting that there's no ceremony or meeting going on in the reception rooms, you can actually visit them. Next is the saint Sernin Basilica, which was uh, built between the 11th and the 14th century. Uh, further additions were made in the 16th and 18th century. But so yeah, um, it's actually the largest remaining Romanesque church in, in Europe. It's about uh, 100 uh, meter long, which is about 340 feet, uh, 200 feet height, and its transept is two feet, 200 feet, uh, feet long. So this basilica hosts 128 relics, some from uh, six apostles and the ones of Saint Sernin, uh, who gave its name, who gave his name to uh, the basilica. So it's the second basilica with the most uh, relics in the world, the first one being um, Saint Peter Basilica in the Vatican. Uh, so if you go inside uh, the saint Sernin Basilica, you will be able to see some medieval frescoes that date from the 12th century. So those frescoes were actually covered during some renovations in the 17th century and rediscovered or uncovered uh, during some later renovation works in the 1970s. So you can have a glimpse of those frescoes over there. So this... One is the resurrection fresco that was made uh, in the 12th century. <clears throat> so it's been listed as a historical monument and is also uh, listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site uh, since 1998 because of its significance for the Santiago de Compostela pilgrimage routes. And finally, when you go to Toulouse, you can explore the area uh, following the Canal du Midi, which is a 150 mile long canal that stretches from Toulouse to set on the Mediterranean Sea. So this canal was actually built in the 17th century under the reign of Louis XIV. And the idea um, was actually to link the Atlantic Ocean to the Mediterranean Sea. So at the time the project was not completed, the second half of the canal that uh, links Toulouse to Bordeaux was actually completed way later. Um, but still, um, it's uh, among the oldest canals of Europe that's still in operation. So it was once used to transport goods and people, but now the Canal du Midi is now mainly used by boaters and also tourists. So to give you an idea, more than 700, uh, sorry, 70,000 passengers uh, take uh, a, a boat along the Canal du Midi 
I did that a few years ago with my mother. It was really nice. We were staying between Carcassonne and Narbonne. And so we took a two or three hour cruise maybe on the on the canal between a couple of locks. That was that felt really nice. Um, so actually some barges uh, that stay on the canal have been converted to theaters, exhibition spaces, restaurants, and even hotels. So you can do as I did and take a cruise for a couple of hours, or you can rent your old boat, or you can take a longer crowd on cruise uh, and spend the whole day uh, or even more on the canal. Um, so you can actually, so as I said, rent your own boat, or you can take your own canoe or kayak uh, and paddle uh, on the Canal du Midi. Or if you just like prefer, uh, if you are a bit seasick, but I guess on the canal it shouldn't be too bad, you can still walk or cycle along the canal uh, on the towpath uh, that has been rehabilitated and it's very flat and, um, and well maintained. So it's it seems very nice to uh, just walk and cycle uh, along the canal. And so the Canal du Midi uh, is on the UNESCO, is a, sorry, has been appointed in a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1996. So here you have a, a better idea of what the canal actually do, looks like and have a, a feeling of the, the atmosphere. So Toulouse is a very, very um, like yeah, the population of Toulouse is quite young. And so a lot of events are organized uh, each year in that city, starting with Rio Loco, which is a world music festival that highlights one uh, different region or country each year and offers concerts, shows for families, as well as visual arts exhibitions and DJ sets for during five days in June along the Garonne River. The Grand Fenetra is a folkloric cultural event uh, that usually happens the last weekend of June or early July. So this festival actually finds its origin from the Roman Empire when Romans celebrated and honored the dead in March by making offerings to the god, to their god, sorry, and sharing a meal with the souls of the dead. So it evolved in the Middle Ages and the modern times, and now it mainly consists in uh, parades in traditional costumes, with people from foreign countries performing traditional uh, folk dance and music, as well as street performances like circle, circus acrobats and so on. And during this event, uh, finitra cakes are share shared among participants. I will tell you more about that a bit later. So the sieste électronique uh, can be translated as uh, electronic naps. Um, so this festival is basically some DJ sets uh, in a park in a very laid back atmosphere. And this one usually happens uh, in the end of June or early July. And Convivienza Festival is uh, a three week festival in July uh, that takes place along the Canal du Midi. So on a huge barge that's about 30 meters long or about 100 feet. Uh, so some uh, bands would perform so from, from the deck uh, of the barge. And uh, as a spectator, you can at, uh, attend uh, along the, the bank of the canal. So there are about one to three concerts per night. And you know, I haven't had the pleasure to attend, but that's something that I'm, I'm planning to do. So when it comes to food, the most emblematic dish that you can eat in Toulouse is the cassoulet. It's rich. It's a very, very rich dish. I like it a lot, but it's very meaty and very rich. So basically, it's a slow cooked stew with a base of uh, haricot beans and meats like sausage, pork, mutton, or preserved goose. Uh, there are a lot of variations from city to city for that dish, as well as the meats used. And actually, three cities, so Toulouse, Carcassonne, and Castelnaudary, claim that they have the original and true recipe. Uh, so in the Castelnaudary version, so they use pork, like uh, loin, ham, leg, uh, sausages, and fresh wine, uh, as well as uh, preserved goose. 
The Toulouse version is basically, um, so use the same kind of meat, but with smaller quantities um, and adds Toulouse sausage as well as mutton and also duck or goose, uh, depending on the season. And in the Carcassonne version, uh, they add uh, mutton leg and one in season partridge. Uh, Tourin is a garlic soup from the south of France. So the version from Toulouse include eggs uh, that are mixed in the soup. So you would uh, beat the egg whites uh, to make some lumps and um, add the yolks to uh, thicken the soup. Cachou la jaunie or a square black candy lozenges uh, made of licorice, sugar, and catechu powder, so uh, an extract of acacia trees. Uh, so they were conceived in 1880 by Léon la jaunie, a pharmacist in Toulouse, um, as a way to relieve his customers from bad breath and cough. And finally, so the fenetra. So it's a traditional pastry with, uh, made of three layers. So the crust, uh, then a layer of uh, jam filling, most of the time apricots, as well as cubes of candied lemon, and on the top, a uh, layer of almond meringue. So the current recipe was officially prescribed in the 1970s, um, but a similar kind of cake was uh, already made during the Roman Empire. So definitely not uh, with the same shape and maybe not, uh, with the same ingredient. There was probably no meringue at the time, but like, yeah, the idea of the cake uh, was uh, that you can share for the fan club was, was the same. All right, so that's it for today. I'm sorry, I went a bit fast because there were like so many things to, to cover. So I had to, to go a bit faster than, than usual, I think. But if you have any questions, feel free, please feel free to ask them. You can unmute yourself or uh, send them in the, uh, in the chat. If you have some comments as well, I'm more than happy to, to receive them. Uh, I had a question. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, and if not, so I will see you next week uh, when I will tell you more about Ursi. Versailles and We Dit Joli Village, We Dit Joli Village in Normandy. All right. I'll see you next week. Have a good day, everyone.